Well, good morning, uh, everyone. You feeling all right? You doing okay? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm both, I'm making sounds. I'm making them have to do work, try to figure out the, the volume. Um, I'm both uh, delighted to, uh, to speak to everyone and, uh, and also um, a bit perplexed doing it on the second day as opposed to start off on the first day. Uh, because I've now had to listen to some brilliant talks, um, which have been fantastic to seed my thinking um, and really greatly inform uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today. I'm a little bit of a walker, um, so I'm a, I'm a bit ecstatic about face to face again, because you can't walk when you're at your own desk with the camera, you know, fixed in front of you. I can try moving around like this, but it just might make, make, make people a bit more confused. Um, and I can see faces. Uh, I think I was talking to someone um, right when we went into lockdown. Um, I gave a really big keynote at a, at a, at a quite large international meeting um, with, that was supposed to be face-to-face -face, uh, with like 2,500 people. They were all there, I think. I don't know, because I was just staring at myself, talking to myself in my, in my own office by myself. So I was hopeful. So the beauty of being able to talk and uh, see your faces, uh, look at body language, um, I, I can tell a joke and you laugh and I go, oh, this is good, uh, versus telling the joke and then just pausing, you know, that kind of laugh track of 70s TV shows where uh, everyone's just pretending as if something was happening. Um, I don't have to deal with that. So I'm, I'm delighted. And I'm, uh, I must thank the organizers for reaching out um, and, and bringing me to you. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, hearing about some of the brilliant research over the, um, over the last kind of day. Um, now, uh, I, I, there was a very gracious introduction, um, but I want to uh, just clarify a few things, give you a little bit of uh, a sense of what we're going to do today, um, and then crack on. So the first is, um, I am not here to speak about UKRI. That's just, it's a nice organization, but that's not what I'm here to do. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you've got about UK research and innovation, more than happy to. Um, but I, uh, I'm certain I have been invited to come and participate with all of you, both because of my leadership work, uh, my, my thinking uh, and speaking around the topics of uh, participation, ethical partnering, um, participatory work, um, and, and collaboration. Um, I'm going to weave in and out a bit of my story, um, my kind of research work um, in this talk today, uh, give you a sense of kind of where I started with my thinking on some of this, and also lay before you my current thinking, um, which uh, is the intriguing title of pipe work. So you could get a sense of what the heck that means, what it might connote, um, and why I think, especially listening over the last few days, uh, for people uh, with where I, I heard some really interesting conversations about infrastructure and uh, and networks and bringing things together and uh, whether or not that's about data or about people or PPE whatever these various permutations might look like um, it, it's as if it's as if we've all been thinking about this a little bit uh, because this talk is going to kind of draw a lot of that all together um, and I'm hopeful that it gives you some things to think about um, over the rest of today um, conversations, but also uh, once you leave here and, and go forward. Um, so uh, I uh, am definitely a researcher. I continue to talk about myself as an active researcher, um, even though uh, I'm technically a science policy maker now. Um, I sit within UK Research and Innovation, but I sit in the strategy directorate. So I sit in the spots that uh, crosses every discipline, works with every single council. There are nine in UKRI, um, two newish ones, one that is called Innovate UK. For some of you to know, that's the kind of innovation agency. Um, and then uh, a, a newly birthed uh, entity called Research England, um, which works all, all around that infrastructure of English universities in collaboration with the, the devolved administration's other funding bodies. Um, and, uh, and the nine bodies, um, getting the chance to interact with them has been fantastic um, because you really do get the sense of what are the trials uh, and challenges of interdisciplinary research, um, but more importantly, what are the, what's the needs um, to be able to try to do uh, both interdisciplinary work uh, but also collaboration. 
um, and collaboration deep into communities, uh, various different organizations, whether or not those are public sector bodies um, or, or working with uh, entities like hospitals and definitely universities. Um, and I know from some talks I had last night that uh, many of you represent various different parts or, or areas uh, and domains from universities and other areas. Um, so I think what I'm going to talk about today will really resonate with you, um, I'm hoping. Um, but going back to the, to the research work uh, that um, I have done and, and been involved in, um, I uh, have definitely led large research teams. I had six active research projects before I seconded into, was seconded into UKRI. I am now substantively there, um, but, uh, and, and um, I have drawn down those, those projects or passed those on to others. Um, but I, in, in doing that work, um, I've always been thinking about how do we break down the barriers between who's a knowledge producer, who's a knowledge user, um, who is uh, an entity that has uh, an interest in the world around them, and how do they develop um, what those ideas might be, whether or not they're based at a university or they're based in uh, another type of, of body. Um, and I had the privilege of directing, I've directed doctoral programs, uh, collaborative doctoral partnerships, um, but, uh, uh, and, and global research clusters. But I had the privilege of running um, a, a, a very interesting research center while I was at the University of Nottingham. And the interesting thing about this research center is that it did consultancy. Um, it did policy work, it did an, an extensive amount of community development work, and it did research projects um, of various uh, types of permutations. And although I have been thinking about a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today <clears throat> for quite a long time, dating back to my community development work um, uh, and working with various local authorities um, and, and kind of regional clusters, it was that work directing that center which really fundamentally started me thinking about a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, primarily because uh, I had to encounter quite a lot of, of challenges. Um, I think probably things that will resonate with some of you um, that I will, I, I will work my way through. Um, and some of that was about uh, trying to do the work itself. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Some of it was also about um, how to keep a center going um, through boom and bust of different kind of funding mechanisms uh, and various different sets of projects, and just trying to, trying to understand what that might be. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about portfolio working today um, uh, that became uh, part of what I really focused on. But one of the most significant parts of that work that really kind of spoke to me and, and started me thinking about this intensely um, was starting to think about um, um, just, just, well, the pipe work. Um, so the interesting thing about pipes, right? You are in this room right now, very lovely, droppy thingies from the ceiling. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're, at your, you're at your tables. It's all quite lovely. You're not really thinking about where your lights, the lights are. You know, you're not really pondering where the heat source is coming from. Um, so you're just, you're just hopeful that you put something into an outlet and it works. Um, and you're, you're hopeful that, you, that, the, that the, you know, you, you'll stay warmish uh, in the room, maybe too warm. Um, but you're not looking at it, right? Maybe if we were in an industrial room um, uh, which didn't have some of the things, you could see some of those. So various different um, kind of industrial buildings or lofts, you would see some of that pipe work. But typically, you don't see it. Your job is just to kind of interface and walk through these spaces and just you know, think about the pipe work and it's just there. The piping is there and you're just hoping that it does what it needs to do um, so you can get on with things. Now, um, this pipe here, I think is typically what most people imagine um, uh, they're doing when they do their work. Um, so this is, uh, if I gave a definition, um, I, you know, I've been, been talking about pipe work as um, the fundamental processes that need to be in place for partnerships, such as contracts, um, agreements, let's say memorandums of understanding, payment, uh, and other aspects of organi organizational structure um, that facilitate collaboration, right? Like that, for me, is the key of the piping and the pipe work. And as I said, we mostly think it's like this, the one at the bottom. Um, you, you dream up an idea. 
You tell someone, I have a brilliant idea. Someone magically gives you money. You go off and find your partners to come and collaborate. And you just do it. You do it. Stuff moves downstream to the next entity. People magically get paid. Um, you go on to produce some sort of outputs that magically go to some other place, and then they come out. Um, you move on, and you may talk to a few policymakers. The whole idea here is that it's just it's this beautiful downflow of just uh, of, of energy. Um, you start it, it moves a little bit, and, and life's good, right? It's all good. The top one is really what the piping is, usually. Um, if you're in any kind of large-scale institution, that is usually what you're dealing with. You have no idea where anything goes. I'm going to guess. You just, you're hopeful, but you don't know who gets paid. You don't know who does the payment. You don't know probably when the payment runs ultimately even happen. Um, you probably have absolutely no idea who does the contracts. You might have a relationship with somebody in the office that does contracts, but you probably have no idea who's done your contracts um, or who might be actually facilitating. Does this sound familiar to people? Yeah? You probably have no idea how to get in and out of buildings uh, if you're trying to secure a space, let's say, for a meeting um, or set something up. Um, you're just putting it into the system, and you're hoping that that stuff works, right? That you can get around to do what you need to do to bring people in and to sit them down. And if you're doing community-based work, or if you're working with a whole set of different sets of entities, this is just confusing land to them, right? They have no idea how any of that works. They have no idea even if they belong in any of those spaces, much less feel, will be welcomed at it. And you're there at the front, forefront trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, forget trying to figure out where the data is, like which server, or which building, or which space, or how you move stuff around. But all of this is actually part of the piping that is fundamental to collaboration. And I, I, find, I found it very interesting as I started trying to figure out, uh, as, a, as a research center director, where the returns of the margins went. Okay? So let's say, so, yes, so, so some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you have a grant. You cost recover yourself completely, or most of your staff. Where does that money go? Because somebody is not paying your salary because it's covered by this project and this grant. Where does that money go? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? You would think if we were in a kind of place where we've got our piping like this, we might move that money towards something else. Perhaps we could reinvest it. Reinvest it into what you're doing, invest it into bringing in new people, all sorts of things that could happen with that cost recovered salary. But because the piping is like that at the top, you have absolutely no idea where that money goes, I would, I would guess. I'm not sure anybody actually can follow it down to the quantum of where any of that kind of money goes. But it's interesting how even if I were just thinking about myself as a, as a director of a center, trying to understand just how to pay the lights and how to pay for the building structure and, and, and putting and, you know, all, the, all the overhead stuff that can go onto projects, um, much less than starting to think about how do I actually manipulate that program in a way or that, or that apparatus so that I could bring in more community-based partners to actually work in the center. Or if I want, and, and, and no one really knowing how to qualify that as a job. Um, it's not a postdoc, it's not necessarily a doctoral student. Um, and we, we talk about payment, payment for participation, but that moves often into very odd, strange spaces where people are trying to figure out what that pay should look like, not just the equitable, you know, trying to have an equitable salary um, or, or, or a salary that is at that kind of basic level of cost of living, but just what do you call it? What's that band? How, do you, how does that band set up? Now, this sounds like a bit more of the HR kind of dynamics, um, as opposed to thinking about it as the collaboration dynamics. But for most of you, you're fostering relationships that are extensive, um, that go back a very long time. Um, and you're building these sets of connections across different sets of people. And the, tr the challenges are often the fact that we then are very reliant on that piping working. So let's say you bring in a community-based organization to come in and work with you. You have funding that comes from somewhere. Um, and let's say it's, it's typical that funding is two years, maybe three years. I'll be generous, five years. Um, and, and of course, you may be paying in arrears. 
So people have to do the work before they can claim the, uh, the work uh, back. Um, and, and it goes into finance to ultimately try to pay them. Um, I have actually had projects where it's taken 18 months for my community-based partners to be paid. Um, and I had absolutely no idea because I just assumed because originally that I did the work, they did the work, they put their invoice in, they filled out all the thousands of paperwork that should happen, that they would get paid um, in, a, in, in, in a timely manner and, and do the run. And it was actually effort I had to extend to go and try to figure out where this lost invoice had gone. Um, and, and eventually when I found it, somebody else is laughing because you sound very familiar, doesn't it? When I eventually found where the lost invoice had gone, to no one's fault, really, it just had gotten lost, um, I managed to get it activated and move it forward. And what was really interesting was people were apologetic, but they didn't understand the catastrophic consequences of not paying that community partner on time. This was an organization that was living month to month with this sorts of funding, and it desperately needed it to pay its workers. If it didn't have those, that funding, it would fold. It would ultimately have to fold or actually stop doing some of the critical work it was doing in the community to be able to move forward. So when we talk about capacity building, right, or we talk about these, these relationships being of mutual benefit, you know, these are the types of things that will destroy that. You might do as much as you can to build the trust up between you and that partner on that particular set of work. But if your piping is of such that it communicates the message that they are not actually important or worthy of getting treated like a respectable partner, then it will all be up for naught. Um, you will be constantly having to engage in an extensive amount of energy just to try to make the system work, right? And probably work because you found workarounds which is why that piping looks like that. Because you have found the entities in all of the various different places you need to get stuff done. Um, and you work around your systems. Um, I, I'm, I am literally just guessing about all of this, but I'm probably right. Because um, it, it actually hasn't mattered where I've gone in the world talking about this. It hasn't mattered the size of the entity, because some people say, oh, it's just because we're a large organization. And it's like, no. The smaller, the larger, it doesn't matter. People have found the ways to be able to do the work they need to do. Um, and they have invested in those relationships, the people who will book the rooms for you, the special ones that no one knows about, right, that you can get access to, um, the, uh, the, the, the various different ways of moving money around, the, the various titles you can give things to just make stuff happen, the events you're able to run. And what happens if that person goes or if they shift jobs? You have to start all over again, right? You have got to go back and build brand new relationships, brand new sorts of sets of context, try to communicate to people the importance of the work that you're trying to do so that you can essentially try to function with the work that you're doing. And at the same time, your partners and your collaborators are being communicated, the messages are being communicated to them. Um, often that they're not worthy, they don't belong, this is not the place for them, um, it is hard. Right? That's usually the message. It is just hard to interface. So I'm talking about a lot of this, not to in any way slag off research offices, fun uh, finance departments, um, you know, security, whoever these folks might be. I'm, that is not the point of all of this. Part of it is to say that a lot of them have their own set of constraints. They've got their own sets of demands. They have their own sets of priorities and their own sets of challenges that they're working with. But what we don't do is we don't interface with them in a way that allows us to understand, as researchers, what they are doing and why they're doing it, and for, um, uh, for, for them to understand what you're doing. So the, the typical times we engage with our pipe work is during conflict. Um, uh, we, we have the swerving, we swerve, but mostly we engage with that pipe work at a conflict moment. I don't have, I didn't get, why it hasn't, and you're calling up people, you know, sending the rage emails um, to try to move stuff along. Um, and that's not a productive relationship. It is, it is absolutely not one. So I've spoken to the Association of Research Managers and Administrators in the UK, and, and part of what I've said to them is trying to say, you are a part of this ecosystem. 
you're not just these folks who just move paperwork from one place to another. And we have to start to think differently about what our research and innovation ecosystem looks like and who's a part of that so that we recognize the centrality of these areas to get this stuff right, right? To get it right, right enough in the sense that people feel valued and they feel like they want to continue to participate to be part of the work. So I've been talking about collaborations and partnerships and kind of merging lots of different sets of things. Um, some of you uh, uh, will, will recognize uh, some of what Isabel was talking about yesterday um, when she was talking about um, co-production. Uh, we, we've got uh, participatory action research for some of you. Um, some of you who are in the PPE world will really understand this primarily from that kind of public participation um, and, uh, and deliberation. We've got citizen juries. We have all sorts of ways that people have been able to sort of capture what collaboration and partnership working and networking looks like. And what's fascinating to me about the, the wealth and breadth of all of that is the amount of creative energy that dis different disciplines have put into thinking about the design of this, thinking about how this works. Um, funders have done the same, of ultimately starting to imagine um, how to fund this type of work and, and what this work ultimately looks like. Um, in UKRI, our public engagement team has come up with a number of schemes that actually fund directly to community groups. Um, and do not have the university interface um, as an institution there at the, at the forefront. Um, and these have been co-developed with groups like the, um, the Institute for Community Studies, who I'll, who I'll talk about in a, in a, in a moment, um, a little more. And what's been fascinating about those sets of projects, um, including the ones that I've been involved in, is how, how they have adapted to changing thinking. Um, and uh, so, as I was saying about the Institute for Community Studies, What's really interesting about this group right now is that they're starting to look across and say, wow, there's so many folks doing community-based projects now, really working with these community researchers. Why aren't we starting to think about community-based research as a qualification that ultimately will allow individuals to accrue a set of skills and knowledge that actually becomes marketable on the marketplace of researchers? Um, as opposed to, you know, you've got your relationship with your community-based researchers or your community organization that's community continuing to engage, but actually starting to imagine that as a skills-based training space that individuals, not because the university has blessed them with having an, uh, an award, but actually it becomes something that these community researchers are actually the, the ones that are thinking about and moving forward. So ICS is developing this in collaboration with others. And as I said, we've been funding particular sets of um, uh, community-focused, community-led organizational um, activities. And so it's exciting to see this, right? It's really exciting to see this kind of thinking um, uh, start to develop um, and, and ultimately move forward. Projects that I've been involved in uh, where I've had uh, you know, five or six different cultural institutions, uh, uh, 50 community-based researchers being a part of all of that, actively going around um, and, uh, and essentially doing health checks on these cultural organizations. Um, it's been so exciting to see that work that was, that was funded um, turn into a social enterprise because the, the community-based researchers are so interested in this type of work that they've created a social enterprise focused on the community itself. Um, or a project that I'm about to talk to you about in a moment um, that, that ultimately ha had a, a number, a number of, of kind of regional development types of things that were attached to it. Now, I'm spending a little bit of time kind of moving my way through some of this to give you some principles. Um, I haven't figured all of this out. Um, I haven't magically solved all of this piping uh, consideration, but as we continue to develop and think about things, we're starting to think both uh, in this way, how do we do partnerships well? You know, what are some of those, Isabel was really talking about some of that from an interdisciplinary perspective. How do we do those principles about the research, the design part of this? What I'm hoping I can add to that conversation um, for the next little bit is the type of stuff about what we might need to do around the piping. Because I think these need to live hand in hand. What we've done is an incredible amount of, of critical thinking about public participation, deliberation, that sort of design work. But we've not really revolutionized any of our infrastructure. The infrastructure that lives underneath that to actually function, it's just, we're just cobbling it together with a bit of hope and spit essentially, um, uh, and, and, and hopeful that it's going to be able to both meet the needs of the types of worlds that we want to create, but also at the same time that it, that it, that it functions well. And, and as we've just been talking about, I don't think it is. 
Um, I think you have to expend an incredible amount of activation energy to make it work. Um, you're probably having to expend an incredible amount of energy to, to, um, to, to smooth the feathers when it doesn't work. Um, uh, and ultimately, you may have lost partners, ones who just become exasperated by, um, by a system that, that, that essentially pushes them out um, uh, or makes it awkward uh, for them to continue to be involved. Um, so I've said this a lot. Uh, and I'm, and, and I've, I'm quoting myself, that's how, that's how, that's how sad this is. Pipe, pipe work is a fundamental and often overlooked dimension um, of collaborative research. And, and I don't mean it overlooked in the sense that none of you have had to deal with payment issues. You have, um, and various other things. But because we tend to treat all of these in isolation um, or as just uh, another frustration that you ultimately deal with, we're not really looking at this from a systemic perspective. Um, and if you're running any kind of clinic or, or an institute or a center or a group, this is a systemic system issue. It's not just one that a few of your entities are having to grapple with. This is actually what your whole group is probably having to deal with all the time. Now, imagine if you didn't have to spend that energy. Just imagine. And you could spend it on something else. I don't know, like your actual research. Um, or collaborating with people to do something really novel and innovative. Um, that is actually part of the infrastructure. And it could be these groups. These groups could be part of that fundamental innovative design work if we start to bring them back into the fold. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm thinking about finance offices. I mean, the, there are legal dynamics to all of this, sure. There are going to be things that are just not possible because you're a legal entity that has only a certain amount of power to do X or Y. So sometimes the imagined things in our heads just aren't kind of possible um, because you'll get in trouble. Um, so we need folks to sort of kind of go, that sounds grand, but we'll be sued, so no, right? We kind of need that. But we are also uh, working with folks that probably have solutions to some of this if they understood what the problem was um, as opposed to when we're only in conflict. And then, again, the rage emails that essentially trying to make stuff happen aren't productive, right? They're just not as productive um, moving forward. So as I mentioned, I, I've, I've been thinking about this. And, and I've been developing this. Uh, oh, oh, yes, it's come up good. Um, uh, with others uh, moving forward. So I, 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 I'm just giving you a, f a flash of a project, um, and I'll spend a few minutes talking about the Common Cause Research Project, um, and then what those things are on the bullets on the side. Um, so the Common Cause Research Project it was a very interesting project that essentially emerged. Uh, I was um, PIing a fairly large, uh, multi-sided, uh, consortia um, working on um, the formation uh, uh, and loss of trust in minority communities um, in the UK and, and uh, primarily thinking about trust in um, authority uh, figures or, or authority entities. So I was really interested in like governments, um, institutions, universities, what, what, what is that loss and formation of trust um, and how do we rebuild it in various ways. Um, and I was interviewed by uh, a leadership fellow that was running um, this fairly large uh, program uh, that was cross collaboration uh, across the councils uh, in um, at that time called RCUK uh, that was called Connected Communities, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and and when we were talking back and forth when I when I had this grant, we were just just noting um, who was a person who looked like me. Um, who might be leading a large-scale research project. And we were like, hmm, it's not a lot of people who identify as female <laughs> like me running these sorts of programs. But we were really starting to talk about um, what sort of partnerships were out there um, in, the, in this kind of connected communities world. What, it, what does collaboration really look like? What does partnering really look like? What does that mean? Does it mean the same to everyone, or does it mean something completely different? And over time, uh, we brought in uh, various other uh, funding bodies um, and, uh, and ultimately um, a, a multicultural think tank called um, uh, Running Me Trust and various other groups to essentially start asking these questions. Um, where and how do we find common cause between change agents and communities, um, uh, black and minority ethnic uh, change ag agents and communities, and change agents and universities? And how do those partnerships actually function and work? And we started by examining projects that had partnerships attached to them, um, because that's where you would find it, right? Uh, that's where you would think you would see it. Um, so we were able to interview the community groups. We were able to interview the researchers uh, together and apart, which was revealing. 
Um, uh, and then also go and look at all the materials that have been collected in various different databases. We had the database conversation yesterday, just to see if we could see the resonances of these partnerships and collaborations. And unsurprisingly, we were finding various different entities that were never mentioned in any of that, those databases. These partnerships are supposedly fundamental to the universities, but yet they were never acknowledging them in some of their materials online um, or in some of the research materials. It was very research focused uh, in terms of various different outputs. Um, sometimes there was an acknowledgement of the contributions of various people, sometimes not. And we kept really kind of circling around the fragileness of some of these partnerships. They, they, were, they were key to, to ultimately uh, uh, people with, with mutual interest. They were really fragile. Um, so we started documenting all of this, and the website is there, and you can go and see all the reports and the videos um, and the ethnographic work done with the research projects. Um, but part of what we also wanted to do was actually hear from the communities themselves. So we created regional-based um, hubs uh, that were led by Running Me Trust in communities, um, and, and these regional-based hubs sat with these community organizations to ask them, what is it like to partner? What do you want to do? And, and also to work with people who had never gone to the universities at all. They'd had no interaction. Some because of choice, some because they just can't, they couldn't figure out how to break in. Um, and so we, we started uh, fostering these networks to come. We gave them money uh, from the project so that they could go off and do whatever research they would like from, uh, from that investment. Um, and, uh, and we wanted to essentially stimulate these, these community-led thinking about research. And what's fascinating is what came out of those, using some of that seed money, has been like um, uh, a prisons-based uh, creative writing project, a youth-led uh, project on knife crime, um, uh, a startup on preventative health, um, all sorts of things that were sparked directly by the community groups. Um, but they did that in collaboration with other community groups. Um, and we were essentially just able to facilitate them all coming together and sharing their knowledges with each other. But as we were having these conversations with these networks and building these other sets of things, we also started talking to these community groups about just what's working and what hasn't. And we ended up uh, being told pretty much consistently um, that there were a number of fundamental issues that were critical to being able to partner and move forward. And that became what you see here, which are these 10 principles for university community partnerships. Um, and those came directly, again, from talking to the community partners, and then they co-developed um, creating these. And what's been fascinating about this list is I've heard very many folks over the last day talk about everything that is on this list. Um, uh, and I am com convinced that uh, a, a large portion of these bullet points here are part of the piping. Um, uh, they, they are things you're probably imagining and you'd want to do, but they are piping work uh, issues that, uh, to work on. So strengthening the community partner, um, we, would, we would probably rephrase that as maybe capacity building, but really ultimately starting to think about what that ultimately looks like so that um, relationships are not extractive. Right? That there is a continuous understanding. And then what is, what's the cost of entities to engage when they can't do something else um, to engage with the, the university partner? Commitment to mutual benefit, obviously these questions of transparency and accountability, fair practices and payment. Um, and what's interesting about the fair practices, this is very, this is, um, uh, very similar to fair practices for participants, but it's different. This is really starting to recognize the skills and contributions of folks that is not about their life experiences or the various different ways that they are participating as both a user or a part of a community, but something is going back to what I was talking about with the Institute for Communities, really thinking about the qualifications that people bring and thinking about what's a fair, fair compensation for that set of work um, and not really uh, wrapping all of this around participant, uh, per participant fees. Um, or participant um, uh, payments. Um, fair knowledge exchange, uh, sustainability and legacy, really thinking about where these relationships can go. Um, uh, equality, diversity, really thinking about the set and the contours of teams, um, who's doing the work, um, who, who, who bears the brunt of that, of, of setting up these relationships. And then the sectoral as well as organizational development really starting to think about what is the power dynamics that exist amongst different community partners 
Um, and what happens when universities go to the same ones all the time to engage in partnerships um, at the expense of other sets of groups? And, and how does that speak to the communities um, uh, and ultimately starts to explain to them that there are going to be certain groups that are better than others? I, I, there is an argument for, for, for financial um, viability. Totally understand that. But it communicates something when there are certain sets of groups that are essentially pushed out um, uh, of, the, of, the, of their relationship. And then obviously this reciprocal learning. How does learning go back and forth? Um, not just developing outcomes from the projects, but actually the learning from the community organizations about interfacing in this partnership come back. Now, quite a lot of this um, is stuff that you could build into the design of the work. And I would imagine most of you do. You probably build it directly into the design of how you do your work and how that works looks. But imagine if you have all of this being questioned by access to facilities, or access to kit, or access to equipment, um, uh, or uh, you know, trying to pay people on time, or trying to move them about. You're starting to unpick all of this. Um, if you're really trying to work with that idea of transparency and accountability and connections between folks, if ultimately they feel like they are unsupported right, by, by, by the institution. Some of this is in your control, and some of it is not. I think it's well worth just being really realistic that you just can't magic up an entirely you know, fantasy university or fantasy institution and have everything in the piping work brilliantly. That's just not possible. But what you can do is start to figure out what's the art of the possible across your institutions um, and starting to work dynamically with different sets of teams to, art, to actually start building across your piping so you, and, and do it in a way that isn't just a benefit to you. I appreciate that that's going to be the most important thing is how to keep your team and your crew able to function and to work. And that's probably just the amount of energy that you ultimately have. But if we're really talking about collaborations and partnerships, uh, especially between universities and other entities, you got to think a little bit bigger than the, your little set of your team, primarily because you probably are interfacing with entities that are engaging with other parts of your institution. And they may be getting a completely different relationship in that other part of the institution than they are with you, good or bad. So, and that also can affect the relationship, right? If they are with one faculty and getting one type of a relationship and with another faculty and getting them a completely different type of relationship. Um, again, that is going to, uh, to, to, to cut into this idea of transparency and accountability because it seems inconsistent. It seems like the institution doesn't really quite know what it wants to do with these sets of partnerships um, moving forward. So the reason why a lot of universities have now turned to actually trying to create a community partnership kind of entity or a unit that's really starting to think about this from a training perspective and really helping people um, kind of move forward. So you can go to the website here. You can see much more about the, the Common Cause uh, research. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this project um, in, in, in general. But it was one of the ones that, as I said, we were doing it in the design. We were starting to think about it in, in the research center. Um, uh, and, and I was moving my way through. But this was coming directly from partners, starting to tell us what would be fundamental to making those partnerships and collaborations work. Um, and this has now gone on to, uh, to impact how um, NCCPE, various other funders, have started to build their networks, build their, the way that they fund, the way that they set things up. Universities have taken this, these, these principles on because they are simple, right? They are very, very simple. They're not big language about how participatory action research works and the various different dynamics and various other stuff. Fair payment is really clear. It's, it, it, it's a very simple type of statement, and it doesn't matter the discipline. It doesn't matter the type of way that you're working. It's literally simple to be able to, to, to enact uh, conceptually. It's simple. It's hard to do. It's hard to do in a way that actually is building that, because you probably don't have an equity board um, where you can just go and pull what a, what a pricing list looks like. You may actually have to develop this um, with other sets of folks. Um, right. Few more things before I, I, I um, uh, kick off. Um, I've been talking about pipe work and, uh, and 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 really thinking about the piping, but I've also been leaning towards what I've been talking about as this collective knowledge economy, um, and uh, and I've been uh, giving some talks about the collective knowledge economy for probably about two two and a half years or so. Um, and there's a reason why I'm calling it a collective knowledge economy, because I think there is something quite powerful in starting to think about ourselves as a collective of entities that are engaged in research, um, uh, and really starting to think about what that knowledge economy might look like. 
So I've got a few slides that are about the stereotype, and then I'll talk about what the collective could possibly be. So this is, this is the stereotype of research and development. The stereotype says it's composed of researchers and innovators only. No communities, <laughs> no citizens, no people, no other things. Researchers and innovators, that's who does the research. Now, I'm a funder. I'm in a room with some other funders. We all know that that is bollocks. We do not believe that that is actually the case. Um, and we recognize quite clearly that ultimately there are many, many, many entities that are part of the system. But the stereotype reifies the fact that there are researchers and innovators, um, uh, and that's what, that's what we've got. And we tend to talk about researchers and innovators, or a PI, or somebody who's in charge of a project, and various other things. We don't really talk a lot about all of these other sets of entities that are critical. Um, but again, this is the stereotype view of what, of what is happening. That is not, I would imagine, what many of you are, are thinking and do all the time. Um, uh, the other stereotype is that R&D is transactional. You do something, you get something. You do it, you get paid, you do the job, you do a thing. It is, there, is a, there, is a, there is a transaction that happens. You might come to a conference because you're going to make more networks. <laughs> uh, you peer review in an effort to help other people because you've been peer reviewed. This idea that there is, there is, a, there is a give and a take um, as part of the system. Uh, I mean, I'm laughing. You're all laughing. But you're also going, this is kind of true. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the power of trying to work through what is actually part of the stereotype, what is reified um, uh, by the practice. Um, uh, and, and so there may be elements of truth in some of this, driven by various articulations of success and excellence. Many of you will probably say that's probably quite accurate, right? Um, uh, very narrow confines and understandings of what is successful, what it, very narrow understandings of what is excellence, people being driven to essentially try to live up to any of those imagined understandings, um, and, that, and that affects the practice. Um, Hyper-competitive, absolutely, uh, highly individualized. So there's this lone researcher that dominates, lone. One person, nobody else. Um, uh, we had our award winner last night just to totally debunk that. Um, but but, but the, the award was given to one person, right? So you understand how we, what we have to do, how we practice in, the, in, our, in our system. We, we have all of these kind of ideas about how all of this structure works. It looks like this. Um, that is the lone male. That's the stereotype. Um, sitting, thinking really hard somewhere. Um, uh, and then doing something. This could be a clinical setting. This could be, it could be anywhere. Um, uh, and they're by themselves doing their work moving forward. And what's really interesting is that this is probably a lot closer. Even though we keep, keep, keep the stereotype at the center, what you start to see that is actually a part of that system are the, the, the laboratory assistants, the librarians, the archivists, the comms team. Shout out to Rachel, wherever you are. Um, IT support over there, um, HR project managers, uh, the technicians. You've got a whole set of folks. Um, I've added to this since COVID, talking about cleaners, how critical people who were doing health and safety to get people back into facilities um, during the midst of COVID. Uh, just the, the, you know, we've got an actual network of folks who are part of the system. They are not adjacent. They are not research supporting. They are actually functional entities. Um, you know, some places would not function without a plant operator. They desperately need someone that is, you know, essentially running their samples. We've done some work to recognize the technicians. We've done work to recognize some of the laboratory assistants. We've got the team science idea. Isabel was mentioning that yesterday. That is progress. But you can see how that's a tiny little part. Um, Francis and others were talking about bioinformaticians. They may not be considered a laboratory assistant or a technician, depending upon where they might be and, and, and where they might be working within particular sets of places. Um, so we've got a whole set of entities that are actually a part of this collective that we don't think about as part of the piping. We just kind of assume they do stuff. Um, and we just hope they do it well, but we don't really kind of stretch this kind of out um, uh, as much as we probably could to harness, I think, the strength and the creative energy from the collective, the big aspects of what the collective is and what it does. I can, I can see uh, Teresa looking at her notes because you probably are going to cover some of this in the infrastructure conversation. Um, and, and, what, and so what all of this kind of comes to 
you know, thinking it through this idea of the piping, the finance departments, the contracts, the legal, collaboration agreements, MOUs, um, you know, startups, tech transfer, um, all, all of this, as well as the types of people. I am really wanting to challenge every single one of you to think far more dynamically about what you do, just far more dynamically. Um, because right now, I think what we've got is we've got an incredible amount of energy brilliant work that people have been doing, but it has been narrowly carved out, narrowly thought through in the sense of, uh, because that's probably all the energy you have, I recognize that, because you're not, it is not boundless. But if we start working together as a set, like a whole set of you as grant holders, if we start working together as funders, if we start working together as people working in participatory co-production, um, uh, participatory uh, public ac uh, and action research, if we bring all of this energy together, we can start to think dynamically about what we need to do about our piping, and we can also start to think dynamically about how do we include more people in this enterprise. So ultimately, not that we just have an inclusive space that has a few more people in narrow categories, um, and then we pat ourselves on the back, but we really think much more expansiveness um, about who is part of our ecosystem and the type of work that they ultimately do. Um, and for me, that is the power of the collective knowledge economy getting it this chance to work hand in hand with that piping in a way to really deliver the transformation for the future. Um, and I know you can do this. I think I've seen you do this in action already, swerving as you've been navigating spaces. I think we can do it dynamically together in ways that would be transformative. Um, so thank you very much. You may say. Thanks so much, Karen. That was a tour de force and a great uh, overview just of the complexity. And I think just judging by the reaction, everybody can relate to so much of that. We have time just for, I think, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Does anybody have a question for Karen? You look around. Yes, sorry, over here, Mary. Yeah. yeah. So to, can we get a mic? Just, we'll just get the microphone. We won't throw it at you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary McCarran from Trinity College. Um, thank you very much, Karen. That was really inspiring, and I could relate so much to, 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 to much of what you said, indeed. And really, I suppose there is just so many structural changes that we need to happen within the university sector to actually make these things possible. Because as somebody who has been a strong driver of PPI, just the simple things of being able to pay people. And I think the PPI network that the HRB is running and has established, uh, and uh, my colleague, I don't know if Sean Deneen is here, you know, will certainly hopefully drive some of this change. But, but there is th this, you know, so much of what you said is just so true and causes, I suppose, people like me who's running large grants as well, so much time and takes so much energy. Yeah. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and helping me to crystallize sometimes why I'm half exhausted. <laughs> I, I, absolutely, and I and I and I think there's there's something there's something about starting to give it a name, right? I think that's 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 where I got to eventually, which was, oh, it's not just this random thing that's happening, or um, because sometimes I would just be seduced because it would work well, and I would be like, I've cracked it, it's sorted, and then I'm like, oh no, this is actually some fundamental systems thinking, some systems work, and I need to I need to invest some time, so. Find your like allies, um, maybe around different disciplines or different subject areas that you can start to harness and work together. And also find your allies within finance um, to, to really get a sense of what they might be able to do in terms of moving forward. Because once, once I've sat some groups down to talk to each other, they realize they've all had a presumptions about how the system works from the different spaces. And they actually could have resolved some stuff very, very quickly. Sarah, do you have a question over there? There's oh, I'm sorry. sorry right here. here. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, Grace O'Malley from RCSI. The pipe work always has valves, and some of the people are controlling those valves who yep. have zero interest in what you're trying to do or might actually try and sabotage it um, out of maybe tribal tribalism, particularly, which I think is very common in a small country like Ireland. From your work, have you found kind of common features of um, people or processes that act as... Uh, controllers of those valves and how do, the ways to navigate them, if there's a kind of a tribal element to it or conflicting politics even. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would use all that same language. I mean, I think there's like 
gunk in the pipes. Um, is probably, uh, and you're not really sure what it is, so uh, it just kind of stops the flow, right? And you're just like, mm, I don't know what that is. And then you try to pour something in there to try to move, bring flowers to people, you know, get, know people by name, start <laughs> chatting to them, just to try to figure out what's going on. And then in other instances, you've got, I think, some pipes that kind of come into an area and then they loop and make a knot. So uh, this part of the pipe thinks it controls something, and this part of the pipe thinks it controls something, and then it gets locked. Um, and that's, that's a lot of kind of systems organizational problematics that um, uh, are uh, institutions that have created multiple things that have slightly similar functions, um, and then they're competing over resources. Um, or they're competing over delegated authority lines or whatever it might be. That's a lot harder to try to figure out, especially if you're really downstream and, and ultimately you're just trying to kick it up because you're not, you're not close enough sometimes to know where the battles are or what might be happening. Somebody is, and, 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 and there may be strategies of trying to find where your allies might sit to be able to navigate that. Um, and in some instances, uh, I, you know, I'm a firm believer, if you can figure out how to build a new pipe that goes around the knot, it, you know, that, that's, that can be to your benefit for a short term. It's a short term solution, but it, can, it just maybe doesn't um, get you involved in long term historical challenges that, um, that uh, you're just not going to be able to fix on your own um, uh, because they're so deeply entrenched in terms of, in terms of practice um, uh, within spaces. But absolutely, gatekeepers as well, people who control the valves and, and take pleasure in opening them and closing them at their whim. Um, sometimes because they like you, sometimes because they don't like you, sometimes because they just their hair is bad that day. I don't know. It's just it's just random sometimes. But opening and closing, but absolutely, absolutely. We'll we'll just take one more. I, okay, but well, two more briefly. Yes, please. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so Sarah Barry from our CSI. Just want to give a shout out for our Sphere program, which I think is a collective knowledge economy. Yep. I've been involved with Sphere for a long time, um, and uh, I think what's really interesting and maybe challenging, but is to bring the, all the management people into the conversation. Yep. Yep. Um, and I think that that's something in terms of um, that particular program, which is a, you know, all institution across the island uh, uh, collaborative training program, mm -hmm. but has been really successful because of the sort of engagement with management all the way through. But it is very challenging. I just wanted to give a, a shout out for, for, for that. Thank you. Uh, that's great, and, and you should be documenting all of these. Anything that is starting to have features of, about working, and not just because it has the outcomes, right? I mean, I think we, we, can, t we can tend to be a bit lulled into thinking because we get a certain set of outcomes that the system is actually functional, um, whereas actually the system is functional because people have, have, have made it work, right? So there, there's probably a value of sitting down with Sphere, and actually it's kind of what I was talking about with the Common Cause Project, actually unpicking what does it actually feel like day to day to try to do that work? Um, and, and what does that entail? And then try to build those learnings uh, much more structurally um, across any other type of program. So it's not necessarily just isolated to sphere. It actually becomes fundamental to just how you do work um, uh, if, if, as, as research work. And that's harder to try to transfer those lessons. But you've got the right set of people in this room to start documenting that. Last question, John Piero. Yeah. Question, just a, a comment that I think your concept of pipe work goes beyond community engagement oh, yeah. to how we engage across hospitals and academic institutes. Totally, yep. And that we've put down a lot of pipes in Ireland over the last five, ten years, yep. and they're not really connecting. That's yep. what it feels like. You could hear that yesterday with, with, the, yeah, with yeah. the kind of data talks. So, you know, if we can, as a community, think about how we connect pipes. So decisions, whether it's ethics, data sharing agreements, mm -hmm. et cetera, can, ha can happen faster. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we get much more value from, from the investment that's been made. Mm -hmm. I, I won't disagree with that. I mean, pipe work isn't, wasn't designed necessarily around just collaboration. I, it, it's just where I was able to see it manifest um, a, in terms of bringing entities who were not part of certain sets of systems into a system and then in, engaging. But it's just organizations. Right, like that, that's what piping is. It's the infrastructure in, in, in institutions. Um, and, uh, and wherever you're trying to do anything within that institution, you're gonna encounter your pipes. Um, and, uh, and so I think this is where your, your collective thinking and energy power 
to really start to think about how to think about the functional aspects of all of this will actually start to transform things much more collective across the wider piece. If we're all doing it in isolation, only about individual projects or individual things, we're just not thinking at that structure systems level to really, I think, harness the type of work that, you, that you're all here to do. Um, and I think that HRB is investing in um, and collaborating. Karen, thank you very much indeed. That's fantastic. Thank you.